public health to moderate the next session. So we are so delighted to have you. Um, Thank you very much, um, Shamini, and it's a pleasure to be here with you all at this conference. I welcome everyone to this session where we have two invited speakers who perhaps have experienced uh, similar incidents and they are going to share with us uh, their experiences and uh, what the problems that they faced. We have today Dr. Dinesh Panipana from uh, Queensland, Australia, and also Dr. Samita Samanmali. And uh, if you are already there, I would like you to identify yourself so that we can start. Dr. Panipana, are you there? Dr. Samita Samanmali? Yeah, good morning, sir. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, I'm Dr. Samita Samanmali, uh, currently working as a uh, medical... introduce you, Samita? Just a minute. So, Dr. Samita Samanmali, uh, she's a medical doctor and has an MSc in Disability Policy and Practices from Flinders University, Australia and also an MSc in Community Medicine from the Postgraduate Institute of Medicine, Sri Lanka. She has worked at the National Hospital Colombo and the Ministry of Health. Uh, she has also published research on health-related quality of life and factors associated among soldiers with permanent disabilities following traumatic injuries during the internal ethnic conflict in Sri Lanka. And uh, now she's also uh, working at the Ragama Rehabilitation Hospital. Over to you, Dr. Samit. You can start. Uh, the, um, there is a problem because uh, my computer doesn't work. I'm logging uh, through my uh, phone uh, and uh, I sent her my uh, slideshow. Uh, is, is it working? Uh, yes, Dr. Santa, I will uh, share your slides for you. Please let me know when you want uh, a slide to change. Is this is working? Yes. Uh, see my slides? Can you see the slides? Yeah. Yes, we can. Right. So I'll just play the slides, is it? Or do you want it's a narration yeah. slide show, right? Yeah. That narration may not work. We'll see. Oh, really? Okay. Oh, but we'll see how it works. We'll have to put it to the presentation mode. Full screen. Yeah, we can't hear. Dr. Samita. Can you okay, talk okay. by way? Huh? Okay, right, okay. okay. Okay, good morning all. Uh, first of all, I would like to thank uh, the University of Colombo and the University of California to organize uh, this hybrid uh, conference uh, to discuss the equity and uh, equality of access to education. And um, actually it is honor to have this opportunity to share my experiences with you. Um, can I move the second one? Second slide, yeah. yeah um, uh, people can define uh, disability in various ways. And, uh, but I like to define the disability is an uh, interaction between features of the person and uh, features of the overall context uh, with the person lives. Uh, actually, uh, over 1 billion people in the world are facing, uh, are experiencing uh, some form of a disability. Uh, 
I'm one of them. Uh, today I'm here to uh, uh, share with you. Uh, today I'm uh, going to talk about uh, my personal experiences uh, in higher education as a person with uh, disability. Uh, before I go to talk about uh, my personal experiences, uh, I would like to tell my story in brief. Uh, some of you may know about it. Um, actually, um, I was uh, born and uh, grew as an able child uh, up to age of uh, 24. Um, suddenly, everything was changed. Uh, I, had an, I had an accident uh, in, when I was in third day in the medical faculty. Okay, um, uh, I'm telling my story first. Uh, I was born as a uh, normal person and I grew up as a normal person, able to before it. Uh, sadly, uh, all the change uh, within one uh, second. I was in a third year in the medical faculty uh, when, when the, my accident happened. Actually, large heart collapsed on me and uh, it was ended up with uh, severe damage to my spine and I became paralyzed. Uh, the rest of my life uh, confined to a wheelchair. Actually, uh, being a doctor was my uh, childhood dream. Uh, I really, actually, I really work hard for that. Uh, I passed my very competitive exam, level exam, and I, uh, I could enter to uh, well renowned in the faculty in the Columbia University. Um, can you change the uh, slide, please? Yep. Um, um, it's very, actually, it was uh, uh, really hard to accept uh, when the doctor said uh, uh, sometimes um, probably you can't walk again and you have to learn how to uh, live in a wheelchair. Uh, I felt at that time I felt uh, my whole future will be dark. Uh, second slide, next slide. Uh, the only light in my life uh, I saw was my continuing my MBBS degree at that time. Um, and uh, in MBBS, uh, degree in, in MBBX course, uh, we have, uh, so we, we not have only lectures, but uh, we also have clinical practices. And uh, several several questions came into my mind. Uh, how can I do this uh, while on beach? Yeah. And uh, actually, I haven't seen a, a medical student in a beach yeah, by the time I had an accident. So it was a, it was a, very, it was a challenge. and. Um, However, I decided to continue my studies. <laughs> Can you go back? Ah, yeah, thank you. The next one. Next slide, yes. Um, I had to face a lot of uh, difficulties, actually. Uh, as I know, um, I was the uh, first uh, medical student to uh, uh, use a wheelchair in the Faculty of Medicine. Um, by, the, by the time uh, of my incident happened, the faculty had not prepared uh, to accommodate the student with a physical disability. Uh, and I, I think uh, that was a new experience for them also. Um, the faculty environment uh, was not supportive of wheelchair use. But uh, faculty, uh, the Faculty of Medicine tried to do their maximum uh, in their capacity. Uh, they made some uh, modification in uh, some buildings. 
pins or text text lib, and uh, they 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 installed a lib uh, into the main lecture hall, but unfortunately, um, most of them were in the upstairs, so uh, they were not accessible accessible at all. Um, so um, there was no any other option except to carry my uh, VHR into the labs. Uh, my friends uh, carry my VHR when I when I need to go to the labs. Uh, but, uh, please, uh, yeah, thanks. And um, actually, I don't know the current situation of the faculty of medicine now, and I I have I haven't been there for a long time. And uh, if you ask the question, what is the most difficult barrier I face in uh, undergraduate uh, course? Uh, I can say uh, finding an accessible washroom in the clinical practice. It was really hard to find an accessible washroom for a VHR user. And the uh, other thing is in this course, uh, we had several field visits. Uh, you know that the environment in uh, Sri Lanka is not convenient for a VHR user. Uh, most of the time, I had to depend on some of the people. And, uh, However, throughout my undergraduate career, my batchmates gave the maximum support. Uh, with the next slide, please. Yeah, and with all these difficulties and with all these uh, support, I could uh, complete my degree in 2011. Uh, next slide. The university culture in uh, Sri Lanka. Mm. The university culture in Sri Lanka is, uh, I think, different from uh, developed countries. Still, there is a strong bond between students. Uh, at that time, we called it a batch fit. If a batch mate uh, needs to support, uh, all that, be together and uh, support that student. Uh, even though there were a lot of uh, environmental barriers, I think this university culture and the bond between students uh, supported me to overcome all these barriers. Uh, next, yes. See this one. Thank you. And um, even though uh, I had that support and I appreciate the university culture and uh, the bond between university students. But I strongly believe that I should have a proper uh, supportive system in the universities to uh, uh, support uh, students with disabilities. But I think uh, this, uh, this supportive system should not uh, be only, uh, not only in uh, tertiary level education, but also uh, in primary level and secondary secondary level education. Uh, um, actually, when I compare the two years ago, uh, when I was in the university, uh, there are a lot of uh, positive changes uh, happen uh, in the universities, as I know. Uh, I mean, the accessibility. Uh, recently, uh, I had uh, uh, discussion with uh, few university students with uh, disability. As I got to know, um, there are a uh, supportive system for students with disability uh, have been uh, developed in several universities, uh, uh, like uh, University of Colombo, University of Kalania, and Pera uh, um, The Inside the university, uh, they have uh, their own supportive system. I think uh, all these supportive systems are working, uh, are working well. Uh, next slide, please. Yes. Uh, after my MBBS, uh, actually, I wanted to continue my further studies. Uh, uh, in 2014, uh, I did uh, a selection exam, uh, MSc Community Medicine, and uh, I got through the exam. Uh, yeah, the MSc Community Medicine course uh, was to be held in uh, PGM Postgraduate Institute of uh, Medicine, Kalam. 
the first question uh, came into my mind is, uh, is it PGM uh, accessible? Because uh, we had lectures uh, in all weekdays, 8 to uh, 4 p.m. And um, I had uh, uh, previous uh, bad experiences related to accessibility. So I thought to uh, write a request letter uh, to Director PGM uh, requesting the accessibility. At that time, uh, the director was uh, Professor uh, Jan Peter Silva. Uh, he was very, he was very positive, and uh, it can, he promised me to do the modification in the job uh, before I start my course, and he did as he promised. So, um, next slide, please. Yeah, uh, we know that uh, we have accessibility law in Sri Lanka. However, uh, most of our public buildings are not accessible yet. Uh, there are four people with disability have to request accessibility all the time, or, or we have to depend on someone's support. I, I think uh, asking someone's support uh, every time uh, will gladly help the dignity of the Person. I have a personal experience asking uh, every time, uh, please uh, help me, and please support me into the building and carry my wheelchair. So uh, I think it's badly affected the dignity of the person. Next slide. Uh, in 2017, uh, I received an um, Australian World Scholarship to study a postgraduate degree at the uh, Australia. It was my first experience uh, living, in, living outside the country. The previous one. Yeah. Uh, the experiences in uh, on Australian university was uh, different than uh, from the Sri Lankan university. I found that uh, the life as a student with a disability in uh, Australia was very comfortable compared to Sri Lanka. The, our, our university premises, uh, as well as the outside of the university, was uh, accessible uh, and uh, I could hardly uh, find the place which was not accessible to my way. Uh, what I noticed was uh, the university always, uh, the uh, previous university always promoted the inclusion of uh, students with a disability in uh, university events and uh, they especially considered accessibility all the uh, university events. So, uh, we, as a person, a student with a disability, we, we all could uh, participate in the university. And uh, there is another thing I noticed. Uh, in the university, uh, there was a uh, disability advice. Uh, we could uh, discuss uh, our matters uh, in studying at the university with the, with the advisor. Therefore, um, uh, Therefore, yeah, I think uh, I had a, a good mental status to focus my studies and uh, I engage in a lot of extracurricular activities. Uh, in university, I work as a um, volunteer in the Lions Club, uh, the university. Also, uh, I was the president of the Sri Lankan Student Association at the Flinders University in 2017 and 2018. And uh, as an association, we could uh, organize uh, several events cultural events uh, in the university. Next. And uh, in the Flinders University, um, there was a uh, Student with the Disability Association. Uh, this is actually an uh, international student with disability association, uh, I was the member of that, member of the association. And uh, what we 
did was uh, we shared our experiences and uh, and uh, get together. We went on trips together, and we we organized some events. Uh, actually, it was a active organization. The main purpose of the uh, disability uh, student with disability organization uh, was uh, support to the student with the disability who are coming from uh, several countries. Next one. Yes. Uh, yeah, I'm not going to compare the uh, tertiary level education in Australia and uh, Sri Lanka. I think it is unfair to compare these two systems because uh, Australian uh, education system they have they have adequate resource and adequate funding, and they can provide a lot of uh, facilities to their student and. But uh, we all know that uh, the tertiary level education in uh, Sri Lanka is uh, limited resources and, and limited funding. Uh, the annual budget allocation, we think the annual budget allocation for education in Sri Lanka is very low. So I think we have to appreciate the university staff and as well as the student, the way they manage these, uh, their, stu their studies uh, with uh, limited facilities. And uh, here I want to highlight uh, the most diff uh, most uh, valuable difference I saw in Australia. Australian society they uh, they they think and they realize that uh, disability is caused by the barriers and attitudes in the society. I think still Sri Lankan society think that the disability is a problem of the person. This is the problem, and I I wish and I think. These uh, negative thoughts and um, uh, negative attitudes will change in the near future. Next one. At last, uh, I would like to uh, give some suggestions to uh, as a person, as a student with a disability. Yes. Uh, when we uh, when we talk about the physical uh, disability, student with physical disability, and the needs of uh, student with physical disabilities are varying depending uh, depend on their physical disability, and sometimes uh, these difficulties uh, may fluctuate. And I think uh, therefore they need the confidential discussion of their specific uh, learning needs with someone. Uh, then I would like to suggest they should have a have an appointed person in the universities, uh, like a disability advisor. Then, uh, then the student can uh, freely talk about their issues. And the secondly, uh, I think uh, we have to realize the importance of reasonable accommodation in the university accessibility, and um, it ultimately promote uh, participation of uh, students with disability. In academic as well as uh, extracurricular, yeah, extracurricular activities and ultimately it protects the dignity of the person and they don't want to depend on others and they don't want to request everything from others and they are very independent in the university. Uh, another thing is uh, I think it's uh, better to have a network with the community services uh, which is it's support to people with disability Mm, then they then the university staff can guide the student with disability to particular services according to their needs. A uh, lot of uh, people, a lot of students with disabilities, uh, need uh, as, uh, assistive devices. Uh, and finally, uh, I think it's better to better if there is if the university has a mechanism to connect students with disability and suitable employers after their completion of the degree um, after the, the graduation. Uh, uh, I don't know whether already the university has a such a mechanism. If not, uh, I think it's better to have a, such a uh, mechanism to uh, guide the student with disability because we know in Sri Lanka, um, 
people with disability are so highly discriminated in uh, employment. Thank you. The next one. Thank you, Dr. Samita. That was very illuminating for all of us. Now I'd like to warmly welcome Dr. Dinesh uh, Palipana. Uh, he's joined us. So let me introduce him. He was the first quadriplegic medical intern in Queensland and the second person to graduate from medical school with quadriplegia in Australia. Uh, he's a doctor, a lawyer, disability advocate and researcher. And uh, he had a motor vehicle ac accident halfway through med school. He has completed an advanced clerkship in radiology at the Harvard Inst University. Uh, as a result of his injury and experiences, he has been an advocate for inclusivity and is a founding member of Doctors with Disabilities Australia. Currently, he works in the emergency department at the Gold Coast University Hospital. He is also a senior lecturer at the Griffith University and a junk research fellow at the Menzies Health Institute of Queensland. He is a doctor for the Gold Coast Titans physical disability rugby team and a senior advisor to the Disability Royal Commission. Dinesh was the Gold Coast Hospital and Health Services junior doctor in 2018. He was awarded the Medal of the Order of Australia in 2019. And he was the third Australian to be awarded uh, Henry Viscardi Achievement Award. He was the Queensland Australian of the Year for 2021. Dr. Dinesh, you may start. Hello, okay. Uh, yes, Dinesh. You can start. Hello, I'm sorry. I think we have a poor connection. I apologize. Uh, hopefully you can hear me now and uh, Yes, you can. Thank you so much for the very kind introduction. And thank you, Dr. Samwitha, for sharing your journey as well. Um, I've known you for quite some time and I've found your journey to be very inspiring. So thank you for everything that you have done. Uh, I'm talking to you here from the Griffith University in Gold Coast, Queensland, Australia. Uh, and like uh, was said, I work in the emergency department of the Gold Coast University Hospital. It's the busiest emergency department in the country and I work as a registrar at the moment. My journey into medical school was uh, not very straightforward. I didn't grow up wanting to be a doctor um, like a lot of people. Um, in fact, I grew up uh, wanting to be a pilot and I wanted to do all these other things, but I uh, never had medicine on my radar. So when I finished high school, I decided that I would become a lawyer. And so I went and studied law out of high school. And uh, as I was studying law, I began to experience depression. I was about halfway through law school and I started to feel down all the time. And then I started to feel anxious. And then I developed a pretty bad case of depression. And I think uh, these days, depression is something that um, is a really important topic, no matter where we are in the world. And a lot of people experience it. 
and in the medical profession in particular, there uh, is a lot of suicide and a lot of depression and a lot of mental health issues. Dinesh, I think we lost you. Can you hear us? Okay, sorry. I think my connection dropped out again. Um, so this might happen a few times through this through this session. But um, anyway, depression is a really important topic. And I think a lot of people go through it in the world. Uh, and it's important that we talk about it. Nonetheless, it was an issue for me too. And these days I have a spinal cord injury and quadriplegia, so I can't use my fingers or anything below the chest. And uh, I have the opportunity to compare having depression to having a spinal cord injury. And I think for me, when I was going through depression, my entire life stopped and I didn't engage with the world I didn't interact with people. Uh, I really struggled at university during that time. And um, everything came to a halt. But since I've had the spinal cord injury, I've been able to do a lot in my life. Um, I've gone through medical school. I've done research. I've achieved all these different things after I had the spinal cord injury. And I think um, the point I want to make is that when we are prisoners of our mind, or if we have a challenging mindset, it's far more difficult to navigate than a physical disability ever is. Because mind is a really important thing and our attitudes are really important because it's what helps us interact with the world. So going through that experience and comparing it to a physical disability is a really interesting thing for me. But in retrospect, the depression was one of the best things that ever happened to me because I started thinking about life a lot during that time. And I started thinking about what I wanted to do with my life. And I realized that I wanted to do something to give back to people and to help people because I started seeing doctors then. And I started, uh, I went to a hospital a couple of times. And I realized that becoming a doctor is an opportunity to really make a connection with people and do something for someone. My mother, who is a really important person in my life, she says that by helping one person, you might not change the world, but you might change the world for them. And I think that is a really important philosophy. So I decided that I Okay, I think we'll have to persist with this problem, I'm sorry. <laughs> so I decided to become a doctor out of that experience and I thought that might be my opportunity to change the world for people and uh, fortunately medical school in Australia then was a postgraduate entry stream so the way to get into medical school was to have an undergrad degree and have a good GPA in that undergraduate degree then sit an entrance exam for medical school and then sit an interview for medical school and then after that you could start medicine so 
I ended up studying really, really hard. Uh, I set the entrance exam, I passed it, and then I became a doctor, or I, went, I became a medical student. So medical school was amazing. I knew that I found what I was supposed to be doing with my life. I think the secret for a lot of us is to seek out what uh, is something meaningful us, for us, no matter what that is. And for me, medicine was it. So I knew that I was doing what I was supposed to be doing with my life. And I was having a great time. But in 2010, when I was halfway through medical school, my life changed. I had a car accident. I was 25 years old at the time. And I have to say, um, you never know what happens in life. You don't know what happens tomorrow and you don't know what happens next week. And uh, it is a very unpredictable thing. So we have to make the most of today. Today, in what we have in front of us is all we have. And I think that's a part of um, a lot of our philosophies in whether it be Buddhist or Christian or whatever faith we believe. It's about being in the moment and being grateful for where we are right now. So it really taught me that because within seconds, my life changed from a car accident. I was driving along a wet highway and my car lost control and it spun and it crashed. And as a result, I sustained a spinal cord injury. I don't think you ever go through life expecting something like this to happen to you and okay we're back uh and um i have to say before the accident happened i didn't really know what it was like for someone with a disability to live in this world and i didn't know what it was like to, I didn't know what it was like to have a spinal cord injury. You know, whenever I used to see a person using a wheelchair, I thought that it was a, must be difficult not being able to use your legs. But I didn't even realize that you also use, lose the use of your fingers. And so even holding something or reaching for something can become difficult. What I didn't realize even more is that you lose things like your lung function. So my lung function is very poor right now, and it's about 35% of what's expected for someone my age and height. I can't control my temperature. All these things have become challenging. But apart from the physical things, I think like Dr. Samitha said earlier, the social barriers are the most difficult things. My mom and dad uh, separated after the accident because trauma causes stress on many families. So my father left. We had to sell our home to meet some of the costs. And uh, some of my friends left. And I learned that even getting around the community can be difficult because footpaths can be uneven or Accessibility into buildings can be difficult. And then education and employment as well. I think uh, Dr. Samitha touched on some of the differences that we have around the world for education and employment. And I think um, in Australia, uh, we are lucky to have new infrastructure and new buildings that are generally accessible. But the attitudes were difficult. When I talked about coming back to medical school, a lot of people said that it's not possible. How can you be a doctor without being able to use your hands? How can you go through medical school? How can you use a wheelchair in the hospital? All these things. And I realized that this was the attitude 
everywhere else around the world as well. But fortunately, I am terribly sorry. I don't know what's happening with the connection, but uh, here we are. So um, as I was saying, this was the, I, know, I realized that this was the attitude among a lot of people around the world, uh, particularly when it comes to medical students with disabilities. Over the last couple of years, I've been involved in work in the US, the UK, New Zealand, uh, and India as well, uh, in making sure that medical schools are open to having a diverse group of medical students. So when I was coming back to medical school, that was really challenging. So I had all these attitudes from doctors and some academics about my ability to become a doctor. And in Australia around the time, there was a, a national policy that came out that looked at excluding medical students with disabilities from studying medicine. But fortunately, I was at a university that decided to look at things a bit differently. And they accepted me back to study medicine in 2015. So uh, it's funny because I'm sitting in that very medical school now in my office where I'm a senior lecturer and researcher. So it's been quite a journey since then. When I came back to medical school, I um, sat with some of the doctors and spent hours and hours and hours learning how to do things again. So I learned how to examine a patient, use a stethoscope. I learned how to put in a cannula and do small procedures without the use of my fingers. And I learned all these different ways to do it. Then I started back at the hospital. And one of the things I realized there was that attitudes are really important. When I started my rotation in the emergency department, the emergency physicians um, and consultants and specialists in the department uh, had a very open mind. And they said, uh, we would love to have you. And we are more than happy to make this work. But then I also interacted with some other specialists from very, very uh, not physical specialties, particularly radiology. And radiologists, really, they do a desk job. They work from a computer, which sorry, there we are, back, which is uh, physically a much easier specialty to work in. But the radiologist said that if you uh, have a spinal cord injury, if you use a wheelchair, you can't work in our department. But here I was with the busiest emergency department in the country, a very physical specialty saying that I could. So I think it's really attitudes that make the difference. Disability is a social structure. It's a social construct. And it's people's attitudes that make people disabled. It's not so much the physical disability itself. But I ended up going through medical school. And I did well. And I passed my exams. 
and I spent some time at the Harvard Medical School as well. And I graduated with awards in the top part of my class. Uh, and then I struggled to get an internship. That became a very difficult thing as well. So there were different attitudes, even though I graduated, even though I did well, even though I learned how to do all these things, getting the internship became a difficult thing. But fortunately, there were people that fought for me to do that. There were doctors and there were members of the community. There were politicians. There were all these people that came together and said he should get an internship because he worked uh, hard for it and he earned it. So I think that's one of the other things around disability is that you have to look at people on their merits. And often uh, people see um, a physical disability or a skin color or a gender, and they make a judgment based on that rather than the merit. And I think looking at someone's merit is really, really important. But I also think that fighting for other people is important. I was lucky because I had a lot of people that fought for me. And there was a talk that I saw by an emergency specialist called Dr. Cliff Reed. And he said that heroes are people that fight for others or do something for others without any expectation of personal gain, taking personal or professional risk, and overcoming fear. You know, when we go to fight for other people, this is the thing, isn't it? We take risks and we have fears, but we have to help other people. And that's what being a hero is all about. And luckily I had enough heroes in my life that fought for me to get my internship. And I became And we are back again. So I started my internship in 2017. Um, and this is my fifth year now as a doctor. I'm about to go into my sixth year. And today I'm a registrar. This weekend, I was working night shifts at the emergency department. And I was looking after junior doctors and the entire department. And I did not feel disabled at all. I have the opportunity to do many other things. Um, I work with the Disability Royal Commission, which is investigating disability and social issues in Australia. Um, I get to work with sporting teams. I get to do all these interesting things, but you know what? One of the most important things about that is education. The reason I'm here talking to you today is because I'm educated. And I think in Sri Lanka, I remember that the kids understood education better than anyone else because education is the way that you can empower yourself. It's the way that we can find a better life. It's the way where we can make a contribution to society. And okay, we're back. And uh, education is really important. So I think we have to enable everyone to be educated, everyone to work, everyone to be a part of the community, because that's empowerment. 
It's not just the right thing to do, but it benefits the entire society because then we have people that are contributing, that are innovating, that are making a difference for the future. So it's up to each and every one of us to be heroes for people. It's up to each and every one of us to bring about change. Okay, I think we're back. So thank you everyone for, before my internet connection dies permanently, I just wanna say thank you for having me and I hope um, it's planted some seeds in your mind about uh, disability and education and what it might look like. And I hope that you go forward and change the world as well. Thank you, Dinesh. Listening to both of you, I am at a loss for words. It, your journeys have been truly inspirational to all of us. And as you have rightly said, I think you, both of you were, have planted the seeds that we should look into further. So I think we could have a few questions. We have a little time. Is there anyone who wants to comment or? Yes, uh, so, um, I'm uh, Dr. Lasanti, University of Kalania. Do you hear me? Yes, we do. Um, actually, uh, Dr. Dinesh and Dr. Samita gave us really an incredible experience and really you two are heroes for me and for many others as well. And you gave a beautiful example that education can make a difference. So uh, yesterday, actually, I was talking about um, a state um, uh, programs, which uh, the Slovenian government, the European, one of the European countries, uh, how they, um, build bridges to bring uh, people with special needs uh, to the uh, public eye and to remove stigmas and, and kind of uh, discrimination from, from general public. So uh, unfortunately, as uh, Dr. Dinesh and uh, Samita mentions that uh, I'm doubtful a little bit whether we have such uh, public or governmental uh, government aided programs to to support this kind of um, people to to use their talents to the uh, economy and to the education and and just uh, to to uh, accept them as as normal like others without any any single difference and you you both are a typical examples for that so I'm really grateful to uh, listen to you both. And uh, I don't have a question, just I wanted to admire you both. And, and you gave all of us a big lesson. And please carry on your journey. And uh, you taught us and you uh, enlightened us in a way uh, to, to learn a lot. Thank you so, so much, Guru Saranai. Thank you, Dr. Rasanti. Thank you. Thank you so much. Any other comments? So, yeah. So this is Lasanti. <laughs> One Lasanti to the other. Hi. Uh, hello, Dr. Samita. Hi, Dr. Dinesh. It was so lovely to hear you speak. Uh, the two of you. And uh, so uh, um, this is um, more of a. 
I mean, kind of a question to which both uh, Samita and Dinesh can respond to. And then it's also, I must say that it's amazing that Dr. Dinesh was able to speak about um, the depression and then the uh, physical disability he is living with because usually, I mean, as he pointed out, the invisible disabilities are most often ignored and those become the, uh, become more challenging uh, in the society because especially in countries like ours where there is uh, so much a stigma surrounding psychosocial disabilities. But uh, more of the question is because we're talking about education and access to education, uh, we know that, I mean, that Dr. Samta spoke about how the access in Australia, her experiences, and I know that Dr. Dinesh has also lived in Sri Lanka for some time. Uh, so in comparison, can, I mean, looking at recommendations, because we also have a lot of academics here who are willing to make changes in Sri Lankan universities, is there something that you would primarily identify um, that could be done here? Uh, of course, obviously, the cost is an issue in Sri Lanka, but then there should be things that we could start with. Any recommendations we would appreciate. Thank you. Um, I think uh, if Dr. Samitha has anything, uh, but otherwise, uh, I think it's just about changing attitudes, really. And cost... Um, if you think about some of the accessibility changes that you make to a building, it actually benefits everyone. It, it's not just for someone that uses a wheelchair or whatever else. It can benefit a lot of people. So I think costs to infrastructure change should be seen as an investment um, for everyone rather than anything else. But I think it's also about um, attitudes. And I think the two ways to change that is both um, the carrot and the stick. I think we are running out of time, Shamini. How are we doing? Um. So we are into the break, but I think uh, people won't mind uh, taking a few minutes. Uh. Okay, okay, right. Your best uh -huh. finish. Sorry, Hi. terrible connection. I'll, I'll, I'll let uh, Dr. Samitha. Okay, go ahead, Dr. Samitha. Okay, thank you, Dinesh. Uh, and uh, about that invisible uh, disability, and uh, sometimes uh, some students, uh, they don't like to declare the uh, de declare some disabilities. I think um, for that, uh, I would like to suggest that if there are a um, disability advisor in the university, so they, we have some confidential uh, issues. We can't talk, everyone, talk with everyone. So uh, if there are appointed uh, person in the university to talk about these kind of uh, uh, sensitive issues, I think it would be, uh, very helpful for a uh, student with that. Okay, Dr. Samita, there is uh, someone who's asked for an explanation about the Students with Disability Association that you were part of in Australia. Yeah, uh, actually it was a, it is a, uh, student with disability, international student with disability uh, in Flinders University. We form it uh, to support the uh, student who are coming from different uh, countries, uh, student with disability. Actually, I think uh, if we have uh, some kind of a unity in the disability, uh, student with disability, because in the university, uh, in the student uh, association, disability association, uh, there were uh, different kind of uh, uh, disability, uh, people with uh, student with disability. So their issues are different. So my as a physical as a person with a physical disability, my issues are different than the, a person with a visual impairment. So um, I think in the university, uh, if you can uh, make a unity, so the then uh, the, your voice 
will be a good. Sorry. Um, so uh, if you have a, a, a association, if you have a unity, I think uh, the voice of a student with a disability will be very powerful. Thank you, Dr. Samit. Dinesh, you want to continue with the aspect of uh, yeah, infrastructure changes as an investment? Yeah, I was, I was just saying, yeah. yeah. Um, so I think all these changes to our buildings and infrastructure and even um, equipment at work or whatever it might be should be seen as an investment because it benefits everyone if it's an auto. I think we lost you. Hmm. I think a stable yeah. infrastructure as well. <laughs> but uh, I was just, um, but I, I think it's an investment. And uh, the other thing is just attitudes, really. So if uh, we have to encourage academics and staff to see inclusion as a, a positive thing, and it's something that can bring innovation and a positive contribution to an organization. But if people don't do the right thing, I think we have to sternly um, discipline them and say that it's not right. Thank you. Uh, I'd like to thank, I think we have to stop right now because the next session is about to start. So I'd like to thank both the speakers uh, your journey has been amazing and very inspirational to all of us. And uh, I hope uh, which you all have made very clear, and that is disability is basically a social or societal construct. So with that, let me thank all of you and also the audience for their comments and uh, uh, the uh, questions and comments and also I personally wish both of you all success in your future endeavors. Thank you Dinesh and Samita. Thank you very much. I close this session now and hand it back to the control panel.